Hello everybody. I'm going to talk about uh, computing Lyapunov functions using neural networks, deep neural networks, and will present you a structural property of these Lyapunov functions, which allows us to avoid the curse of dimensionality in this approach. Um, yeah, so here's the outline of my talk. Um, I will first give a little introduction to Lyapunov functions. Possibly this is known to most of you. Um, I will then talk about deep neural networks. Again, this is something where most of you will be familiar with, but just to get the setting right and to define notation, I think it's good to have a little introduction here. Um, the real uh, theoretical heart of the talk will be in this third section where I talk about complexity analysis of the method and show you what this has to do with so-called small gain theory from nonlinear control theory. Uh, and I will then not only try to convince you that this is theoretically a nice approach, but also show you by means of using a training algorithm and some numerical examples how this really, how this really works. Okay, so first part, let's talk a little bit about Lyapunov functions. Um, what I'm considering are simple autonomous ordinary differential equations, nonlinear x dot of t equals f of x of t with initial condition x of 0 is equal to x naught. Uh, f maps rn to rn and what we assume throughout the talk is that x star equal to 0 is an equilibrium which means f of 0 is 0. And then we are interested in Lyapunov functions and a continuously differentiable function v which maps rn to the non-negative reals is a Lyapunov functions if it is positive if and only if we are not in the equilibrium, so in the origin. If it tends to infinity whenever the norm of x tends to infinity. And if the directional derivative of v in the direction of the vector field is negative whenever we are not in the origin. All right, so that's a Lyapunov function, very well known concept introduced by Lyapunov at the end of the 19th century. And um, this is the way you will see it in most textbooks. Um, what I will also be using frequently is a different way to write a Lyapunov function by means of so-called KL functions and K-infinity functions. Actually, K-infinity functions are the most important here. These are three functions, alpha 1, alpha 2, and alpha 3 from this class K-infinity. I will tell you in a minute what that is. And then we can rewrite the conditions on the Lyapunov functions by these three inequalities, a lower bound on V, an upper bound on V, and an upper bound, a negative upper bound on the, on the orbital derivative. Now what is a k-infinity function? A k-infinity function is a function which uh, maps the non-negative reals into the non-negative reals. It's continuous, it's strictly increasing, it maps zero to zero, right? So this is this point. And it's, it grows unboundedly, which of course you cannot see here, right? So that's, this is a k-infinity function. And then it is known that the classical definition of a Lyapunov function I showed you before is equivalent to the existence by, of these three functions. Possibly we need some rescaling. Right, so why are Lyapunov functions interesting? Because they tell us something about asymptotic stability. And uh, the theorem that in various forms and flavors goes back to many different people. Here I'm quoting one which is probably closest to this uh, result by Masera in the mid 20th century. Uh, it says that under suitable regularity conditions on F, the equilibrium is globally asymptotically stable if and only if there exists a Lyapunov function. Yeah, global asymptotic stability, You, I guess you are all uh, acquainted with that. So what does that mean? This means that whenever I start close to the equilibrium, I stay close to the equilibrium for all t greater or equal zero. Equilibrium here is again always the origin. And eventually as t tends to infinity, we converge to the equilibrium for all initial conditions, right? And this for all initial conditions is the global part of the definition. And this is why it's called globally asymptotically stable. Again, there is a modern control or system theoretic terminology which uses a so-called KL function and it just combines all these inequalities here into one single inequality and then of course the qualitative behavior sits in this KL function. 
So a KL function is a function which is in K infinity it's in its first argument and decreasing to zero in its second argument. And this K infinity property captures the stability part of the condition and this convergence to zero captures the convergence part of the definition, right? So, and again, this is an equivalent way of writing it. And for simplicity today, I'm only using this global asymptotic stability definition, but of course there are local and regional versions of this theorem and of this property, which are just as interesting, maybe even more interesting, but in order to keep this technically simple at this point, I decided to, to just look at globally asymptotically stable equilibria here. Okay, this very simple example. Every one of you knows the mathematical pendulum here in this nonlinear version where we have just uh, three parameters. We have this k, which is the uh, friction constant for linear friction model. We have m, which is the mass of the pendulum here. And we have g, which is the gravity constant. And then what this pendulum does, it starts, pendul it starts swinging and then if k is greater than zero, which we assume here, it will become slower and slower. And then what happens is that we see if we plot x1, which is the position, and x2, which is the velocity in the phase diagram, we see this movement here, which means that everything converges to the origin, which is the equilibrium of the downhanging pendulum. And then the Lyapunov function could, for example, look like that. And if I superimpose the solution on the Lyapunov function, so it's easier if we flip it a little bit like that, you easily see that actually the negative orbital derivative says that the Lyapunov function decreases and that eventually we converge to the global minimum of this Lyapunov function here. Okay, yeah. Now, Lyapunov functions characterize asymptotic stability. Why should we compute them? Well, first of all, because they provide a certificate for asymptotic stability. If we are able to come up with the Lyapunov functions, then we know that the uh, equilibrium is asymptotically stable. Second, because if we do not have global asymptotic stability, Lyapunov functions allow us to, well, estimate subsets of the domain of attraction via the level sets. This is interesting. And this is also possible if we only have a, a regionally or a V which is defined on a, on a subset of Rn. It gives us information about robustness of stability. Stability margins can be computed with respect to additive perturbations, for example. And in case of control Lyapunov functions, which is something I will not address, but which is something which base is, is, I guess, of high interest for a generalization of the results I'm going to, to talk about in the future. Um, in the case of control Lyapunov functions, it's also possible to design stabilizing feedback loss on the basis of Lyapunov functions. And this has motivated a lot of research for computing Lyapunov functions numerically. And uh, I think one of the first papers I know of is uh, uh, works via a so-called uh, via the so uses the so-called Zuboff type equation, which goes back to to Zuboff. A Zuboff type equation is a PDE of this particular form, and you immediately see that if this is a if W is a positive function outside the origin, then this is a negative term. And this gives you exactly then this negative orbital derivative that the Lyapunov function should have. So you can write this as a first order PDE. And you can solve this kind of PDE or a transformation thereof via series expansion. That's one possibility. You can use finite elements for this kind of equations, which we did a while ago. You can use finite elements, but then a particular kind of linear programming approach, which is particularly nice because it gives you something which is um, uh, a true Lyapunov function, not only a numerical approximation. Um, there is a completely different approach, which uses so-called sum of squares methods. It combines some polynomial approximation with an algebraic, which are algebraic features. And there is uh, um, mesh, there are mesh-free methods like the radial basis function method, which was, was introduced by Peter Giesel a while ago. And there are also like more exotic methods which correspond to like concepts like quantization, which use piecewise constant approximations. Yeah, what all these methods have in common is that uh, the number of unknowns, which are either grid points or coefficients, whatever are you un the unknowns in your numerical scheme, 
grows exponentially with the space dimension n, right? So if the if the ODE becomes higher and higher dimensional, then this the number, the, the computational effort and also the storage effort grows exponentially. And this is what is called the curse of dimensionality. I think the term comes from optimal control, but it just as well applies here in this setting. <clears throat> and effectively, this limits all the approaches I mentioned to ODEs of low dimensions, say up to five. Well, I mean, if, if you tune your method really cleverly, then maybe you can get a bit higher, but not, not, not pretty much, right? And for general ordinary differential equations, I do not think that this is, um, that there's a way to overcome this problem, right? Because the function v itself becomes, can become more and more complex if the dimension gets higher and higher. But, and that's of course the, the art, one can possibly find suitable low-dimensional structure in the Lyapunov functions, which can then be used to represent the function with much less effort. And this is precisely what this talk is about. So I would like to talk now how we can detect and exploit such, such structures. Yeah, um, I will use neural networks for this. Um, and um, this is of course not a new idea. And you see that this has a long tradition going back to the early 1990s. Uh, this is a selection of papers. It's possibly incomplete. Please drop me an email if you know additional papers which are important in this context. Um, what is the main difference is that um, not the computational side. So all, most of these papers contain training algorithms and they are quite similar to our approach that I will present in the end of this talk. Um, but the difference is that none of them provides a complexity analysis or proposes network structure, analyzes Lyapunov function structure that overcome the cause of dimensionality. And in my opinion, this is the main contribution, the distinctive contribution of the rest of this talk. Okay, very briefly, what are the neural networks I will look at in my talk? Well, this is the general deep neural network with two hidden layers, and I will use a special, uh, a special instance of this kind of, uh, this kind of network for the approximation. Um, quick uh, explanation, so what do we have here? We have uh, the input, which are x1 to xn. This is just the, the, the state, the current state of the system. We have two hidden layers with scalar values y11 up to yn1n. Oh, there's a typo here. This should be n1. I'm sorry. And same here, y12 up to yn22, it should read here on the level 2. And um, then we have this function here, which combines the values from this level. And this is the approximation of the Lyapunov function in the end. Yeah, how do we compute these? Well, these are the usual activation functions. So we make a, a fine combination of the input values, plug this into an activation function sigma 1, and then we get the value yk1, and we do this for k from 1 to n1 here. <clears throat> yeah, w here is a vector of weights. This dot denotes the usual scalar product. <clears throat> Better k1 is a scalar parameter, which just shifts this finely. And sigma1 is an activation function. So there are many different choices. I think most of you know about this. <clears throat> the simplest one is just the identity. Um, then we have the maximum, which is uh, very popular in, in neural networks because it's, uh, it's very easy to implement. And we have this smooth approximation of the maximum which has the advantage that the overall function that you get from the input to the output is a smooth function, which has some advantages. Yeah, this is the formula to compute the values in this layer from the input. And similarly, we compute the values in the second layer from the first layer. It's exactly the same formula. We get another set of weights and parameters and another activation function. And then in the end, we simply make an affine combination of these values here to get the output value. And this uh, theta up here is just the vector of all parameters which are used in the network. Okay, I think I didn't tell you anything new. This is the general structure and we will use a particular form of this kind of network for our computation. Right, and what we get in the end, if we have 
trained the parameter, if we have obtained a good parameter, is hopefully an approximation of a governor factor. Okay, now when can this work efficiently and how exactly should the network structure or substructure of the structure that we have here look like? Well, there, was, there is this famous universal approximation theorem. It says the following, if k is compact, then we can look um, at the maximum or the infinity norm on the set k, so the maximum of a function g on the set k. Of course, we assume continuity here so that the maximum exists. And then we can define this space of functions where the sum over the this infinity norm on k over all derivatives up to order m are, um, are bounded by 1. And alpha here is the usual multi-index uh, for the higher derivatives. Um, and then there's a theorem which goes back to several people, and this is the one that I got from this paper by Pocho et al., which I will cite a little more detail in a little more detail later. And it says that if this uh, sigma 1 is infinitely differentiable and not polynomial, and its one layer is actually enough here. And then for any epsilon greater than zero, a neural network with one hidden layer provides an approximation, which is as good as you wish, right? So epsilon can be as small as you like, and the difference between the function you want to approximate and this function here with the optimal choice of the parameter vector theta is less than epsilon which um, is possible for all the g, and the minimal number of neurons is this one here. So it's epsilon to the power of minus n over n. So in words, we can get an arbitrarily good approximation with a neural network, even with only one uh, hidden layer, but the effort grows exponentially in the dimension n of x. Right? So again, we have the curse of dimensionality because this tells us here if n grows and we keep epsilon fixed, then the effort grows exponentially fast. So the number of neurons that we need in this layer become larger and larger and they grow rapidly, right? very, very quickly. And now the question is, and this is the paper I just mentioned, um, when is it possible to avoid the curse of dimensionality? And uh, this paper, which is a survey that appeared a couple of uh, years ago, uh, somehow I managed to, well, I got interested, I must say, because of the title, because it explicitly says avoiding the curse of dimensionality. And this has a couple of very nice results uh, written in a very accessible way. And this is basically what made me think, can we use this for Yakuna functions, right? Can we get the structures that are described in this paper can we make them work for Yakuna functions. Yeah, so what does this paper uh, describe? Well, this paper explains that if the function g that we want to approximate by a neural network with a given accuracy epsilon, if it has this kind of compositional form, so basically we divide the vector, the state vector x into sub vectors of smaller dimension m, and then we, uh, we assume that the function g is a sum of, uh, sum of a set of other functions, hj, which only depend on these sub-vectors zj, right? And m should be bounded independent of m. So if we increase the overall dimension, the dimension of these sub-vectors should not increase. And then actually we can approximate uh, these kind of functions with the without the need to let the network grow exponentially. So this is proven. And for Lyapunov functions, right? So if this function you want to approximate is a Lyapunov function V, this is precisely the form of V that follows from what is called nonlinear small gain theory. Let me explain a little bit what this nonlinear small gain theory says, or the particular form that I'm using here. So what we do is we decompose the whole ODE that we are looking at in, uh, in the form that we uh, decompose the state vector x into uh, s vectors, s subvectors. So this is the first one, this is the second one, this is the last one. This one here we call z1, this one here we call z2, and the last one here we call zs, and of course all the others in between. Two. 
we decompose the vector field with the same dimensions in this form here. And by z minus i, we denote all the z's which are not zi, right? So if we take out the subvector zi, then all the rest is called z minus i, right? And these zi's are vectors of dimension di, and then fi, of course, maps from rn to r di. And then we can rewrite the overall system as a collection of subsystems of this form, right? So zi dot depends on f is equal to fi of zi and z minus i from i for i from 1 to s. That's what we can do. And then we can assume that um, the fi's admit Lyapunov functions, which kind of, so if you for a moment look only at the term up to, up to here where my cursor is, then this is basically a Lyapunov function property, the orbital derivative. And this says, well, if the z minus i is large, right, or the components, right, this is the j, uh, which are not in zi, then we allow that maybe decrease should, is not no longer necessary, right? So it, it's not necessary that the function decreases, so it can actually even increase if the other states are large, right? The one that are in this c minus i. So it's a relaxation of the usual Lyapunov function concept. And this relaxation is called an ISS Lyapunov function. It's called input to state stability. And the input uh, to the systems are exactly these um, vj of, of zj, or actually the zj. So the other, the other states, the states of the other subsystems are considered as, as inputs. And then if these functions gamma ij are sufficiently small, then for suitable lambda i, which um, can be computed, we can actually define these functions vi hat, and then we can sum up this vi hat, which only depend on the ci each. And this is a Lyapunov function for the overall system. And as you, what you see is that this is precisely the structure that we need in order to get an efficient approximation by a neural network which is not suffering from the curse of dimensionality. Yeah, this nonlinear small gain theory has a long, long history already. Uh, it started also in the 1990s and the, there are really like important results around, well, starting in 2007 which, with the PhD thesis of Bjorn Buffer and then many, many more evolved from that, including this particular result that I have here. Right. So now we have this structure, and of course it's not always easy to define these vi hat. But the, the, the trick now is that we use the neural network to find these vi hat, right? We do not want to compute them by hand and put them together, that's difficult. But we want to exploit the fact that we know that they exist, which is what this nonlinear small gain theory tells us under this, well, under the assumption that these gains are indeed sufficiently small. We want to exploit that. Okay, so here's the first theorem that we can derive from that. Um, it says that Lyapunov functions of this form, which exist under this small gain theorem, where the di, the overall dimension, is bounded by some dmux, and dmux is independent of n, they can be approximated with any arbitrary accuracy epsilon with a number of neurons that grows only polynomially in n. So we can actually avoid the curse of dimensionality if the Lyapunov function is of this form. And an appropriate network architecture is simply one that, uh, well, kind of thins out the layers and basically uses the first subvector as an input to the first part of the first sublayer and then so on until the last goes into the last sublayer. Each of these sublayers computes this vi hat up here, right? And then we combine, combine all these uh, linearly to get the sum of v, right? And again, we don't, you not need to know these functions. All we need to know is that such a decomposition exists. Yeah, the drawback is, of course, what? Well, we do not need to know the vi hats, but we need to know the subvectors, the appropriate subvectors. 
And that's of course difficult because who tells us in advance how we should split up our vector such that this decomposition exists? That's not, not clear at all. And there's a nice little trick that actually we can add one more network layer which does this job for us in the training process, which basically computes the ZI from the XJ arbitrarily, right? So here we have another layer. These are just linear activation functions down here. So this is just a coordinate transformation. And um, what we get with this structure is that we do not only can split up our, our state vector, we can do that, but we can even uh, define the ZI as arbitrary linear com combinations of the X. Okay, this is the second theorem. We assume that um, we can write our Yapunov function in the following form. It's a sum of sub Yapunov functions, which depend on a linear transformation of x, ti of x. And uh, the low dimension now comes in via the rank of ti. We assume that the rank of ti is less or equal than d max. And this d max should again be independent of x. And then we get the same result as before. For any accuracy, we can approximate this function with a number of neurons which grows only polynomially. And again, um, this is something I would like to stress once more. We do not need to know the vi hats. The training process will compute them for us. But in this case, we also do not need to know the subvector. So the, in the ideal case, if the training works, then the neural network will figure out what are good subvectors for us. Yeah, so that's the hope. So the next part will be to see how we can define a good training algorithm in order to go to numerical approximations too. Yeah, training neural networks. The basic algorithm for training a neural network is the following. We define what is called a loss function. In our case, this loss function will take three arguments, one scalar argument and two vector arguments, and it maps them to R. So it gives a real value for each of these uh, arguments. We choose a test data set. In our case, we look at a compact set on which we want to compute the Lyapunov function, compact subset of the state space, and we just pick randomly generated test points, x1 to xm. This is what we do here to get, generate the test data set. And then we use an optimization algorithm to minimize this expression here, right? And this expression is simply the, the sum up the loss over all the test functions and then we divide by m, so it's an average of the, of the loss, or if you want an L1 term of the loss function, if the loss is non-negative. And we optimize this with respect to the network parameters, and what's important here, and this is a little bit different compared to other training algorithms, this L contains as an argument the value of the function w, which should approximate our Lyapunov function. It's derivative. That's important because the Lyapunov function has a condition on the orbital derivative. And of course, we need the test point itself in order to evaluate what we want to, uh, what, what, whether we are in the equilibrium, near the equilibrium, or far away. Yeah, and this is a loss function that has been very successfully used for other PDE uh, governed problems, so for solving PDEs with neural networks. Um, here's a completely incomplete list of uh, references, but what you see is that the, these are all like clustered in the last three years. So this is really a brand new development and uh, we kind of borrowed the idea from, from this kind of approach. Why should we do that? Well, because in the end, we could actually solve a Zuboff type PDE. So for example, this one, right? So we want to achieve this negative orbital derivative away from the origin. And uh, this equation would exactly guarantee this, right? So we could do that. And then we need, of course, also the upper and lower bounds. And for this, we define this kind of unusual inequality boundary conditions by using this uh, alpha 1, the alpha 2, this k-infinity functions that I explained before in the definition of the Lyapunov function. 
Yeah, and um, then of course you could ask, well, why x squared or norm x squared? Couldn't we use something more general here? Yeah, of course we could, but it's actually known that uh, you can always, if, if you have a Lyapunov function, you can always transform it such that you can write this here. Um, and so this means that this is not a loss of generality here. We just may have to play around with the, with the bounds here to allow a feasible solution. Okay, the loss function now penalizes the violation of this inequality. So this is the first inequality here, right? This is the second inequality, this one here, and since it's only a once, sorry, this is equality, so this is why we take the whole term. This is an inequality, this is why we only take the negative part of this expression here, right? So it's defined down here. And this is an inequality to the other direction, so we only take the positive part of this difference here, right? And mu is a weight which kind of weighs the importance of these boundary conditions and the orbital derivative. Yeah, there's a potential problem. Um, one can prove that a solution V of this uh, Zuboff type equation always exists, but it may not be of the desired form, which is easy to represent by the neural network, right? So even if a compositional Lyapunov function exists, this compositional Lyapunov function may not be the solution of the Zuboff equation. So it may actually be better to give the algorithm a bit more freedom to find uh, the uh, Lyapunov function. So instead of uh, solving a PDE, we can solve a PDI, partial differential inequality, where we only require less or equal, which is somehow more natural anyway, right? Because this is basically more or less what the definition of the Lyapunov function. And the only change in the loss function is that instead of penalizing this term directly, we now also take the posit only the positive part of this expression here and then square it. How does this perform? Here are some numerical examples. Let's briefly go through the general settings of the numerical examples. So we have this first layer of activation functions, which are linear activations fu activation functions. These provide the coordinate change. And the first layer then is just a coordinate transformation of the original input. And then in the second layer, we use this so-called soft plus uh, function, which approximates the, the maximum, but is a smooth function, so we do not get difficulties with using the derivative. Um, we, for all numerical examples, it was okay to use 128 neurons per sublayer, so each of these gray box contains 128 neurons. Uh, the implementation was done with TensorFlow in uh, Python. Um, the optimization was performed using the uh, stochastic gradient method, so-called Adam optimizer, which is implemented in TensorFlow. The computation was performed on the cube minus 1, 1 to the power of n. And the optimization terminated when, for in each test point, so the maximum we take here, in each test point, the loss function is less or equal, uh, strictly less than 10 to the minus 6. And this was feasible for all the examples. Well, except one, I would show. Let's start with something simple. Say, as a proof of concept, we want to check whether this works for um, this simple sec two dimensional nonlinear ODE. Um, it is known that this equation admits a compositional Lyapunov function, but it's also easy to see that this term here is important, so it's not an entirely trivial one, not something like x1 squared plus x2 squared, but we need this fourth order term here to make it really a Lyapunov function. And um, we perform the training with this inequality loss function, which implements the partial differential inequality. We use uh, two sublayers with the dimension d max equal to one, because we know that we can actually find this decomposed by a function which only depends on x1, and the second function which only depends on x2. And we use 200,000 test points in the training. This is what we get. This is the function we see. And if I, I turn around the picture a little bit, you see that this is the function itself. It's nicely positive definite, and it's zero and zero. 
And this wireframe here is the orbital derivative, which is as it should be negative, except in the origin. Well, there may be a little bit of uh, violation here in the neighborhood of the origin, which is not easy to see in this picture, but at least numerically it's fine, except maybe in a small neighborhood here. Computation time was 48 seconds. And uh, interesting here is that the same setting with the equality-based loss function, where we really try to enforce an orbital derivative which is equal to minus x norm x squared, right, fails to produce a satisfactory result. So convergence of the loss function could not be reached, and what we get if we just truncate or stop the uh, iteration is this one. From here it still looks kind of okay, but again, if I turn it, you see that there's something wrong. The minimum is not in the origin as it should be, but it's uh, shifted to the left. And the orbital derivative is obviously positive here in this area, right? And not negative as it should be, right? So it's not a Lyapunov function. So it's really important to give the algorithm the flexibility to solve the partial differential inequality instead of equality. Now, the second example is going to show you what happens in higher dimensions, and I use a 10-dimensional example. What I wrote down is first something where it's easy to see that the small gain condition is likely to be satisfied. I didn't check it rigorously, but uh, it's very likely because it consists of five two-dimensional subsystems which uh, are all asymptotically stable, and they are coupled by coupled by relatively or by nonlinearities with a small factor minus 0.1 or plus 0.1 in front. In order to make it a bit more difficult for the neural network to detect this structure, I applied a linear coordinate transformation, which of course the algorithm does not know, right? And then we end up with this system and this um, t inverse times f hat time of t. This is what I implemented in the algorithm. Um, so here's the structure again in color, which I already explained. Um, and here we use five sublayers, with each of which has dimension two, and 400,000 test points. And of course now I can't show you the whole Yapunov function, but I can show you projections. This is the projections into the x2, x8 plane. Looks perfect. This is the projection into the x9, x10 plane. Again, this looks just like a, you would like a Lyapunov function to look. Function itself is positive, except at the origin. The orbital derivative is negative, except at the origin. This is exactly how it should look like. Computation time here was 266 seconds. And there's an interesting observation because our theory so far only guarantees that we get an approximation to a Lyapunov function in terms of the values. But the figures suggest that what we compute here is indeed a true Lyapunov function, except possibly in a small neighborhood of the origin. So it looks like the method performs even better than what our theory uh, is able to explain so far. So that there is certainly uh, space to get more, or well, to find out more, right? Yeah, and um, this second fact that it looks like a true Lyapunov function is actually also confirmed if we evaluate V along computed solutions of the ODE. So here we have a couple of different initial values and you see that the, the computed Lyapunov function always nicely has this strict decreasing property, right? For this initial condition, for this initial condition, and also for this initial condition where we only choose one component equal to one and the rest equal to zero. Yeah, with that I'm done and uh, I would like to conclude. So what I showed you is that deep neural networks can be used for computing Lyapunov functions. That's not an entirely new uh, insight, but uh, what is new is that if the Lyapunov function has a compositional structure, we can overcome the curse of dimensionality. Again, this is something that was probably easy to conclude if we have, uh, if we know the results from the neural network literature. But um, the interesting thing is that we can, with this approach, now handle dimensions that are far beyond those feasible for grid-based method. And the second is that this compositional structure of the Lyapunov function is not entirely uh, 
artificial, but rather follows from a well-established theory, the small gain theory, and this nicely describes situations in which a compositional Yakuno function exists. Certainly not the only situation in which this happens, but a certain situation in which it, it works. Yeah, what's on my list for future work? Well, first of all, I described that apparently the method works a little better than we expect. And the question is, how can we uh, verify that? Well, either a priori, theoretically, but also a, sorry, a numerical approximation, a numerical verification could be interesting. So if we have computed the Lyapunov function, is there a quick and simple test which can show us that indeed the function is a true Lyapunov function, right? Which we do not know immediately when we solve the problem with a new network. And then, well, since I'm coming from control theory, of course, the question whether we can extend this to control Yakunov functions is a really interesting question, which I would like to address. Okay, here are three references. The, uh, basically, the contents of the, this talk is in this recent archive preprint here. Um, there is, uh, parts of the results have already been accepted as a conference paper for the MTNS conference in 2020, which is uh, postponed to next year, to 2021. Again, there's a preprint of that available. And if you are entirely new to this area, I can recommend this very nice survey, which tells you about how we can compute Yakunov functions numerically. Uh, this is the state of the art of about five years ago. Yeah, with that, I'm done and I would like to thank you very much for your attention.